Section 2 of Self and Self-Management, Essays About Existing, by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some Axioms About War Work 1. This essay concerns men, but it concerns women more. When citizens begin to learn, through newspapers and general rumour, that voluntary war work is afoot, and that volunteers are badly wanted, and that there is work for all who love their country, then those who love their country are at once sharply divided into two classes, the people to whom the work comes, and the people who have to go out to seek the work. The former are the people of prominent social position, the latter are the remainder of the population. The prominent persons will see work rolling up to their front doors in quantities huge enough to overthrow the entire house. The remainder will look out of the window and see nothing at all unusual in the street. They are then apt to say, This is very odd. There is much work to do. I am ready to do my share. Why doesn't somebody come along and ask me to do it? And they feel rather hurt at the neglect. And finally they sigh, well, if no one gives me anything to do, of course I can't do anything. Such an attitude would be quite reasonable if society was like a telephone exchange and anybody could get precisely the person he or she was after by paying a girl a pound or two a week to stick plugs into holes. But society not being like a telephone exchange, the attitude is unreasonable. Patriots cannot expect the organisers of war work to run up and down streets knocking at doors and crying, Come, you are the very woman I need. However much urgent war work is waiting to be done, nine-tenths of the individuals who are anxious to do it will have to put themselves to a certain amount of trouble in order to discover the work, perhaps to a great deal of trouble. Having located the work, they may even have almost to beg for the privilege of doing it. Again, they are rather hurt. They demand, why should they go on their knees? They're not asking a favour. A woman will say, I went and offered my services, and he looked at me as if I was a doubtful character, and you never heard such a cross-examination as I had to go through. It was most humiliating. True, true. But could she reasonably expect the cross-examiner to see into the inside of her head? The first use and the last use of the gift of speech is to ask questions. Moreover, respected madam, it is quite probable that the cross-examiner was not a bit suspicious, and that his manner was simply due to dumbfoundedness, to mere inability to believe that so ideal a person as yourself had, so to speak, fallen from heaven straight into his net. And further, respected madam, are not you yourself suspicious? If the cross-examiner had come to you instead of you going to him, might not your first thought have been, what advantage is he trying to gain by coming to me? I shall say no. If it is true that people who ask for work are stared at, it is equally true that people who are asked to work also stare a little haughtily. And when the latter graciously promise assistance, they often say to themselves, I shall do as little as I can because I'm not going to be taken advantage of. And they almost invariably end by doing more than they can and by insisting on being taken advantage of. Human nature is mean but it is also noble. Axiom. The preliminary trouble and weariness and annoyance incidental to getting the work are themselves a necessary and inevitable part of war work, just as much as bandaging the brows of heroes. 2. Life is a continual passage from one illusion to another. No sooner has the eager volunteer found out that the desire to help is apt to be treated as evidence of a criminal disposition, and that war work is as shy as deer in the depths of a forest. No sooner has he or she discovered these things than yet another discovery destroys yet another illusion. 
the war work when brought to bay and caught is not the right kind of war work. You, for I may as well admit that I am talking direct to the eager volunteer, you had expected something else. This war work that presents itself is either beneath your powers, or it is beyond your powers, or it is unsuited to your individuality, or to your social station, or to your health, or to your hands or feet. You can scarcely say what you had expected, but at any rate. I will tell you what you had expected. You had expected the ideal, work that showed you at your best, picturesque work, interesting work, work free from monotony, work of which you could see the immediate beautiful results, work which taxed you without overtaxing you, really important work without the moral risks attaching to real responsibility. Such was the work you had expected and the chances are ten to one that the work you have actually got is dull, monotonous, apparently futile. Any fool could do it, though it is exhausting and inconvenient. Or, on the other hand, it is, while dull and monotonous, too exacting for a well-intentioned, mediocre brain like yours. You don't actually mean that, but you try to be modest. In short, it is not suitable work. Axiom, there is not enough suitable work to go round, nor the thousandth part of what would be enough. Unsuitableness is a characteristic of nearly all war work. Lowering your great powers down, or forcing your little powers up to the level of the work offered, this too is part of war work. 3. Again, you have to get away from the illusion that you can live a new life and still keep on living the old life. Everybody, as has somewhere been stated, possesses 24 hours in each day. Everybody occupies every one of his 24 hours. You do, though you may think you don't. If you do not occupy them in labour, then you occupy them in idleness. If not in usefulness, then in futility. Now, idleness and futility are much more difficult to expel from hours which they have appropriated than labour and usefulness are difficult to expel. But if war work is brought in, something will have to be expelled. Habits of labour and usefulness are sometimes hard enough to change. Habits of idleness and futility are still harder. If you were previously spending your afternoons in giving and accepting elaborate afternoon teas, you will have more trouble in devoting your afternoons to war work than if you had been spending them, for example, in the pursuit of knowledge. It is child's play to abandon the pursuit of knowledge. No moral stamina is required. But to give up the exciting sociabilities of afternoon tea is a tremendous feat. So much so that if you are a votary of this indigestive practice, you will infallibly endeavour to persuade yourself at first, I can manage the two, war work and afternoon teas as well. I can fit them in. You cannot fit them in, at any rate successfully. The essence of war work is that it may not be fitted in. If it does not mean sacrifice, it means naught. Sacrifice is giving something for nothing. You cannot give something and yet stick to it. Certain persons are apt to buy an article to give away and then are so pleased with the article that they decide to keep it for themselves. They thus obtain for a period the sensation of benevolence without any ultimate corresponding sacrifice. This is the nearest approach that I know of to giving something and yet sticking to it but it has no relation whatever to war work. Axiom, if a teacup is full, you cannot pour anything into it until you have poured something out. 4. The next and the next to last illusion to go is a masterpiece of simple-mindedness, and yet nearly all who take up war work are found at first to be under its sway. It is the illusion that war work, being a fine and noble thing, ought to change people's natures and dispositions 
in such a manner as to produce the maximum of cooperating effort with the minimum of friction. Now, the very heart of all war work is the grand and awe-inspiring institution of the committee. If you are engaged on war work, you are bound to sit on a committee, or in default of a committee, a subcommittee, which usually has more real power than the bumptious and unwieldy body that overlords it. And if you are on neither a committee nor a subcommittee, then you are bound sooner or later to be called up before a committee or a subcommittee, and to be in a position to give the committee or subcommittee a piece of your mind. Thus your legitimate ambition will somehow be satisfied. But let us suppose that you are at once elected to a committee. Well, among the members of the committee are three persons you know, Miss X, Mr Y and Mrs Z. Miss X used to be a mannish and reckless and cheeky young maid. Mr Y used to be an interfering and narrow-minded old maid. Mrs Z used to be nothing in particular. You enter the committee room and you see these three together with a few others who have not a very promising air. Probably no sight is more depressing than the cordon of faces round a committee room table. You, however, are not downcast. You feel in yourself the uplifting power of a great ideal. You are determined to make the best of yourself and of everybody, and you are convinced that everybody is determined to do the same. But in less than five minutes, Miss X, despite her obvious lack of experience, is offering the most absurd proposals. She has put her elbows on the table, and she is calmly teaching all her grandmothers to suck eggs. Mr. Y is objecting to the ruling of the chairman, and obstinately arguing against a resolution that has been carried, and indeed implying that the committee ought not to do anything at all. As for Mrs. Z, she has scarcely opened her mouth. When the chairman asked her for her opinion, she blushed and said she rather agreed, and she voted both for and against the first resolution. Is it conceivable, you exclaim in your soul, is it conceivable that these individuals can behave so in such a supreme crisis of the nation's history? at a moment when the nation has need of every citizen's loyal good will, of every... etc., etc. No, they cannot have realised that we are at war. And sundry other members of the committee are not much better than the ignoble three. Indeed, your faith in committees is practically destroyed. You say to yourself with your blunt, vigorous common sense... If only the committee would adjourn and leave the whole matter to me, I am sure I could manage it much better than they are doing. You consider that a committee is a device for wasting time and for flattering the conceit of opinionated fools. Then Mr. Y becomes absolutely impossible. You feel that you are prepared to stand a lot, but that there is a limit and that Mr. Y has gone beyond it. You are ready to work, and to work hard, but you cannot be expected to work with people who are impossible. You decide to send in your resignation to the chairman at once. I hope you will not send it in, for at least half the committee are thinking just as you are thinking, and one or two of them are thinking these things not apropos of Miss X, Mr Y or Mrs Z, but apropos of you. And if you are startled at the spectacle of people persisting in being just themselves in war work, then the fault is yours, and you should be gently ashamed. You ought to have known that people are never more themselves than in a great crisis, especially when the crisis is prolonged. You ought to be thankful that the committee has unscaled your eyes to so fundamental a truth. You have realised that we are at war. You ought also to realise that it takes all sorts to make a world, even a world at war. You ought to imagine what would happen if every member of the committee, like you, 
resigned because Mr. Y was impossible, and thus left the impossible Mr. Y in possession of the table and the secretary. Axiom. The most valorous and morally valuable war work is the work of working with impossible people. And may I warn you that you will, later on, if you succeed as a war worker, encounter more terrible phenomena than Mr. Y, who at the worst can always be outvoted. You will encounter, for example, the famous and fashionable lady, who, justifiably relying on human nature's profound and incurable snobbishness, will give all the hard work to you and those like you, while appropriating all the glory and advertisement for herself. And, more terrible even than the famous and fashionable lady, you will run up against the official mind. The official mind is the worst of all obstacles to getting things done, and the gravest danger of the war worker, particularly if he attains high rank on committees, is the danger of becoming official-minded himself. 5. When you have proved that in war work you are a decent human being, and you will prove this by sticking to the work long after you are weary of it, and by refusing to fly off to something else because it promises to be more diverting and less annoying than your present job, then you will part company with the war worker's last illusion, namely the illusion that her efforts will meet with gratitude. Gratitude is going to be an extremely rare commodity, and it is not a very good thing to receive anyhow. You see, there will be so few people with leisure to devote to gratitude. Everybody is, or will be, war-working. Even soldiers and sailors are doing something for the war, though to listen to some civilians one would suppose the military side of war to be relatively quite unimportant. No, gratitude will not choke the market. On the contrary, criticism will be rife for we are all experts in war work. The highest hope of the average war worker must be to escape censure. Official food controllers, who are possibly the supreme type of war worker, are thankful if they escape with their heads. And herein is a great lesson. Axiom, the reward of war work will be in the Treaty of Peace. End of section 2